What is really holding women back? Are women oppressed today in the United States? These are the million dollar questions when it comes to modern day feminism and gender equality. Because while some feminists believe they are suffering in American society, anti-feminists think the entire movement has become a hoax. So which side is right? Well, after doing some research on both sides of the equation, I have gathered some points for you to decide what your truth is in this debate. And while you're at it, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn your post notifications on for more content. So first things first, in order to answer the question, are women oppressed today in the United States, we first need to understand what oppression is. So if you go on Old Reliable, Webster's Dictionary, and if you look up the word oppression, it is defined as unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power. Now, when it comes to gender, gender oppression involves the use of power in social structures to limit the opportunities, rights, and well-being of certain gender groups, often favoring one gender over another. When feminism first started in the late 19th to early 20th century, I will say that women were limited in opportunities and rights as it related to voting, education, employment, and legal rights. So just to elaborate, women in the United States during this period did not have the right to vote until the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, and women of color did not have the right to vote until the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1965. When it comes to education, while there were educational opportunities for women, higher education was often limited. Many universities, including Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, among many more, were initially exclusive to men. When it comes to employment, women were often confined to certain occupations, such as teaching, nursing, clerical work, and they faced discrimination in the workplace. They were also excluded from various professions such as politics, medicine, law, among many others. And they were paid significantly less than men for civil work. There were also limitations when it came to legal rights. Laws regarding property, ownership, divorce, and inheritance were often biased against women. Now fast forward to today, this entire dynamic and culture has shifted. These limitations are no longer in place. Through the feminist movement and the advocacy for gender equality, key milestones and accomplishments have been achieved. For example, I can't really think of any constraint or limitation that prevents women from pursuing diverse opportunities and shaping their lives as they see fit today. In fact, if we take an objective look at what women have compared to men, I will say that women have far more rights today than they ever did. They can own property, they can vote, they can start their own company. In fact, the federal government will help them through the women-owned small business federal contracting program. There are also anti-discrimination and equal opportunity laws through Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the Equal Pay Act of 1963 are in place to ensure fair treatment in various spheres, including employment and education. Title IX, enacted in 1972, prohibits sex-based discrimination in federally funded education programs and activities. Not only has this created a fund for scholarship opportunities for women's sports, but it's also created policies within universities that require them to publish grievance procedures for students to file complaints of sex discrimination, including complaints of sexual harassment or sexual violence. VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, which was enacted in 1994, addresses issues such as domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. The act provides funding to domestic violence shelters, law enforcement, courts, rape crisis centers, and children's services, among others, while also providing housing protections for survivors of violence. When it comes to education, the National Girls Collaborative Project works to bring together organizations that are committed to encouraging girls to pursue STEM careers because they want, not need, but they want women in these fields. There are also quotas that corporations use to increase the representation of women in leadership positions. There's affirmative action policies that consider gender and their admission processes. And awareness campaigns aim to address historical underrepresentation. 
Women's health has received increased attention with policies focusing on maternal leave and maternal health, which aims to create a balance between work and family life. In fact, when it comes to child custody, mothers tend to be favored in these cases with fathers paying a lot of child support. Even when we talk about sexual violence, you know, while the Me Too movement has brought forth tremendous awareness on the prevalence of sexual violence, there are still many men who have been victimized and who don't feel safe or comfortable coming forward and sharing their story. That there are so many men, there are so many young boys who have been sexually abused, who have been assaulted in their lifetime, and they have not come forward. Maybe they won't come forward because of the fear that's, you know, ingrained in that, ingrained in coming forward and sharing their story. So that is something that I did want to share because while sexual assault is more geared towards, you know, women when it comes to sexual harassment allegations, it's once again geared towards men, there are also men who have been sexually harassed, who have experienced street harassment from women, who have been sexually assaulted, and it's very important that we do shed light on these areas. So with this all being said, right, with these policies, laws, and regulations that are actually in the favor of women, do you think it's fair to say that women are still oppressed in the United States today? Well, when it comes to some modern day feminists, they argue yes. They say that women are oppressed because their right to an abortion has been taken away from them. They say that racism still exists, there is the gender pay gap, they continue to be discriminated against. And they also focus a lot on intersectionality. So intersectionality basically recognizes that people's experiences with oppression and privilege are shaped by many social factors, such as race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and sexual orientation. Now, I do wanna come back to this point in just a moment, but just to shift gears, when it comes to people who are against modern day feminism, their argument is no. Women are not oppressed in the United States because they have access to so many resources and privileges that men don't have access to. Looking at preventative care in terms of pregnancy, women have so many options available to them in terms of birth control. There are pills, rings, patches, shots, cervical caps, IUDs, and more. With men, there are only two forms of birth control, condoms and vasectomies. Regarding the gender pay gap, individuals who are against modern day feminism, they argue that the discrepancy with pay has a lot to do with differences in education levels, career choices, and work experiences. Some will also say that the reason why there is a wage gap is because women aren't advocating for themselves. They're not asking for raises. They're not asking for what they want. They're scared of conflict and that's what prohibits them from getting the pay that they you know, desire. Regarding discrimination, there are policies and procedures that I previously mentioned that have been implemented to create a safe space for women coming forward, you know, when it comes to sexual harassment, but also when it comes to sharing their perspective and sharing their voice. DEI programs and initiatives, diversity, equity, and inclusion have been enacted to ensure that every single person within an organization has the right, has the safety, has the comfort to come forward and share their perspective. You know, when it comes to anti-feminist individuals who are against modern day feminism, there's also, they bring up a lot, this concept of misandry. I actually created a YouTube video on misandry. So if you're curious, and if you're interested in learning more about what that is, I definitely recommend that you go check that out. But essentially, misandry is hateful speech and prejudice against men, right? It demonizes men, it calls them presumptive rapists, and it also assumes that women are always the victims and men are always the oppressors, men are always the ones that are aggressive, right? Now, I think this would be a great time to go back to the concept of intersectionality. So if modern day feminists can recognize that people's experiences with oppression and privilege are shaped by many social factors, like I mentioned, like race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, economic status, etc., then wouldn't intersectionality also affect men? Are there not men who are survivors of violence? Are there not men who are fathers and who deserve access to paternal health care as well? Do the mental health or does the mental health of men not matter as well? Like, what do you think? Based on all this information, do you think that women are oppressed today in the United States? And if you do, why? 
If not, do you think that modern day feminism should start using the concept of intersectionality to include men in the conversation? Wouldn't this achieve the gender equality that so many feminists are advocating for? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and turn your post notifications on for more content. And I will see you very soon with a new video.